This is the first in a series of two lectures on the doctrine of angels. Some time ago, a friend of mine said, you know, he said, I married an angel. My wife is an angel. And I thought, that's wonderful for a man to say that about his wife. And he wanted to say, yes, he said, she's always up in the air harping on something. Now, uh, we're going to talk about the subject of angels, but it's not about fussy wives who are up in the air harping on something concerning their husbands. She may have the story could have been told, said that she married a demon. <laughs> I don't know. But I have in my own notes here that you'll, of course, have in printed form uh, some 100 pages, uh, well, not quite that many, about 90 typewritten pages, and how in the world we're going to uh, cram all this in two lectures, I don't know. I wish I had have originally made room for uh, more tapes on the doctrine of angels, but we just don't have the time. But I think we can introduce the subject, and uh, at least you'll have the printed material here. We're going to look at uh, six main uh, divisions here in the study, the existence of angels, and what the Bible says about their very existence, and then their origin. We'll look at sur such subjects under that as the source uh, from whence came angels, the method, were they born or created one at a time or mass-produced uh, in a factory, uh, the method of their origin, and then the time. How long have angels been in existence? Uh, billions of years before men at the same time uh, or after the creation of man? We'll look at that. And then the purpose of angels. Why were angels created in the first place? So the existence of angels, Roman numeral 1, we'll examine that. The origin of angels, Roman numeral 2. And then the nature of angels. What is an angel like? Well, an angel is a spirit being. It is invisible. They are innumerable without number as far as man's concerned. Individual, however, in spite of the fact that they are, the number is uncountable as far as we're concerned, yet each, each angel is an individual, has an individual personality. There are millions of snowflakes in a storm, but each snowflake is different. Each angel is different. They are superior to men, at least for the present time, but inferior to God. And perhaps angels are made, as one theologian has suggested, like man, angels may have been made in the very image of God. That's concerning the nature. And then Roman numeral four, the moral classification of angels. There are two kinds of angels. There are the good angels, the elect angels, the faithful angels, and then there are the fallen angels the evil angels, the cursed angels. So there's the good and the bad. And then the characteristics, Roman numeral five, of the faithful angels. What about their rank? Are they organized? They have generals and sergeants and privates. Well, we're going to list some seven different ranks of angels that the Bible tells us about. And what about their appearance? How would you recognize an angel if you saw one? What does the Bible say about their appearance? Then names and titles of the good angels. They're referred to by no less than eight titles and names. The work and ministry of angels. What do they do in heaven? And what are they doing on earth? Then the destiny. What is the future uh, destiny of the good angels. And after that, we'll look at Roman numeral 6, the characteristics of the fallen angels. There are 13 names for fallen angels. One of the most common names is the name demon. And we'll look at that when we come to it. The location of fallen angels. We'll see that there are two locations 
Certain angels have access to the heavenlies, fallen angels I'm talking about, and to the earth, but some are confined right now in the heart of the earth, in a murky, dark prison house. And then the sin of these bound angels. Why are some fallen angels already incarcerated and other fallen angels not incarcerated at this present time? After that, we'll look at the organization and the rank of the fallen angels. They are organized very highly as the good angels are organized. The appearance of fallen angels. Does the Bible give us any description of demons or fallen angels? Yes, in at least three passages it does. And then the personalities of fallen angels. They are they possess personality as the good angels, and they are individual as the good angels are. The activities of fallen angels. What are they doing? At least seven vicious kinds of action angels carry on today. Uh, one of the worst, of course, of these actions is that of demon possession, where they actually possess human beings. We'll be looking at 12 biblical examples of this fearful thing of demon possession and uh, to show us that demon possession did not, uh, was not phased out and did not disappear with the completion of the New Testament, but it's always been known throughout history and four modern cases of demon possession on the part of Charles Manson and Bishop James Pike, Gene Dixon, and Gary Gilmore. That last name might not be as familiar, but I think when you review his case history, as you see in your notes, uh, the uh, details will come back to you. Then the destiny of fallen angels. And finally, I thought it would be a help to put in a dictionary of terms concerning the activities of fallen angels that you might recognize uh, their theology and what uh, they're doing today, this dictionary of some of their activities. So the existence, the origin, the nature, moral classification, characteristics of the good angels, characteristics of the bad angels, these six main divisions now uh, will introduce our subject of the doctrine of angels. The existence of angels in the Bible is similar to the existence of God. It's simply taken for granted. Uh, they're mentioned in 34 books of the Bible, a total of uh, some 273 times. So to deny the existence of angels is to deny the inspiration or the accuracy, the truthfulness of the Word of God. The existence of angels is taken for granted in the Bible, both Old and New Testament. Then the origin of angels. What about the source of their origin? Well, angels, like everything else in the universe, of course, was made by God the Father through Jesus Christ in the energy of the Holy Spirit. Everything that was made was made in that order. The method of their origin. Angels, like men, were created by a special act of God, and angels did not evolve. Uh, Psalm 148, we read these words, Praise ye him, all ye his angels. Praise ye him, all ye his host. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded, and they were created. So each angel, therefore, seems to be a direct creation from God. Now, God created one man and one woman taken from man, but he has never created any other person from that point on. He allows human beings to carry on the spark of life. But apparently, <clears throat> that's not true with angels. Each angel is like Adam, a direct, special creation uh, from God. Now, their number, once completed at creation, apparently was forever fixed. This is assumed because we never read of God creating more of them, <clears throat> and Jesus said that they didn't reproduce themselves. Now, in Luke 20, we're told they can't die, and if they don't reproduce themselves, and they can't die, and no, no more being created, then we 
conclude the original number of angels will never increase or decrease in size. And for this reason, of course, they, these reasons, they must be considered a company of beings and not a race of angels like men. The time or their origin. Well, Job 38 <clears throat> seems to indicate that angels were created either at the uh, right at the beginning of the creation of the earth or before the creation of the earth, but at any rate, they definitely were created before man was created. And the purpose of their origin, in a sense, was the purpose that wherefore God created man. Angels were created to glorify Jesus Christ. Colossians 1.16 brings this out, and uh, also Hebrews 1.6, and then Revelation 4.11 probably is the keynote uh, verse to this entire subject of why God did anything. The Bible says that the inhabitants of heaven are singing about God, and they say, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they were, they are, and were created. Now, <clears throat> what about the nature of angels? Well, they are spirit beings. Now, we're definitely informed by Christ himself that they do not possess flesh and bone. They may have some kind of body, but it would be a spiritual body. It would not be a body basically limited to time or gravity or made up of protons, neutrons, and electrons, at least in the, the order that uh, the physicist would uh, tell us that the uh, protons and the atoms uh, function in. They're spirit beings. Now, some believe they have bodies and others believe they do not. Church historians and theologians have argued over this for years. It's a little silly how they used to argue. They used to argue how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. And I always uh, thought if I were an angel, I certainly wouldn't want to dance. If I was dancing in the first place, I wouldn't want to dance. But if I were, I would not want to dance on the head of a pin. Uh, but uh, they are spirit beings as opposed to material uh, beings constructed of atoms as we are. Then they are invisible beings. Every now and then they do show themselves. They have the power uh, to take upon some uh, physical appearance, but they are basically invisible beings. Perhaps the reason for this is to prevent men from worshiping angels. Uh, even a man like John the Apostle uh, was uh, guilty of, and his zeal uh, uh, to uh, fellowship with this angel in the book of Revelation to fall down and he was going to worship him. And the angel said, don't worship me, worship God. So here was the beloved apostle. That's probably basically the reason they're invisible. And they are innumerable. God knows their number, of course. But they are presented to man as being uncountable. In fact, uh, there seems to be uh, some scripture that would indicate uh, that uh, angels are as uh, numerous in the universe as there are stars. Angels are connected with stars on several passages. And uh, so maybe each angel uh, is assigned a star, or maybe each star has an angel attached to it. And keep in mind, scientists tell us there are probably as many stars in the heavens as there are grains of sand and all the seashores of the world. So their number maybe and probably is in the trillions and maybe quadrillions of angels. Well, their number is innumerable. And then they possess separate and individual personalities with no two probably being alike. For example, they have the three necessary features required of personality. They have intelligence, and you'll have the scripture, of course, here to look up. They have will, and they have emotion. Uh, they display joy. They shouted with joy at the creation of the world, in Job 38. And they have desire. They aspire to do certain things. First Peter says that they desire to look into the things of salvation. 
then they are, because of Adam's fall, superior to men. Um, this will not always be the case, of course, when the sons of God come into their own, the regeneration, Matthew 19, we're told about that, the millennium, then we'll judge angels. But until that time, God has subjected us a little lower than the angels. They are superior because of our sin to men. Uh, we know that they're stronger than men, and we know that they're smarter than men, and they are swifter than men. They are, however, inferior to God, even though they're superior to men. They're not omnipresent. They can't be, uh, well, they can be, uh, if you, if you uh, get them all together, they're everywhere, probably in the universe, but no single angel can be in more places than one, like no single human being can be in two places at the same time. They're not omnipresent, and they are not omnipotent. Many things angels cannot do. They are not omniscient. For example, they did not know in the days of Jesus when the second coming was going to take place. Matthew 24, verse 36, Jesus said, But of that day and of that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels, of heaven, but my Father only. God hadn't got around to telling them. I suppose they know now, but they did not know then. Now, angels like men may have been made in the image of God. How was man made in God's image? Well, it has been suggested that this image consisted of two things, personality and holiness, because personality gives the basic capacity to have fellowship with the person of God, for only real persons, of course, can have fellowship. I cannot have real fellowship with an animal, with a dog or a cat, even though they're maybe my pet. I can't have fellowship with them because I'm a person and I can only have fellowship with other creatures that are personalities, that, have, that are persons having personalities. God is a person. And in order to have fellowship with God, one must have personality. Angels have fellowship with God, therefore, probably they have personality. And so personality gives the basic capacity to have fellowship with the person of God. And holiness, the second attribute here, provides the basic requirement to enjoy that fellowship. For two cannot experience fellowship unless they are morally agreed. So if this definition be correct, uh, then angels can be said to have both uh, angels, rather, can be said to have been made in the image of God also, inasmuch as they have personality and they have holiness. Now, the moral classification of angels. We've looked at the existence, the origin, the nature. Now, what about the moral classification? Well, it is believed that all angels were originally created without fault, and like Adam in the garden, they were placed on a probation of some sort. Adam could have remained sinless, but he chose not to. And apparently, all angels that were created could have remained sinless, including Lucifer, the archangel uh, who turned his back upon God. He could have remained sinless had he chosen to, but he failed that probationary period and sinned. Now, it's suggested by Revelation 12 that Satan was able to persuade one-third of the angels in heaven to side in with him in this terrible rebellion. You have some theological words here, and we might look at them for a minute here. You have posse non bicari and non posse non bicari and non posse bicari. Let's look at the first one, non, I'm sorry, the first one, posse non bicari. Posse is able, non is no, and bicari is uh, sin. So you have posse non bicari would be able not to sin. This would describe angels before the fall. They were posse non bicari. They were able not to sin. And then they sinned. Well, what happened? Well, the ones who sinned and followed uh, Lucifer, 
now became non posse, non vicari, not able not to sin, and they can never be saved. While the ones who determined not to follow Lucifer but remain faithful to God are now non posse vicari, not able to sin. And that's different from being able not to sin. You see, that sort of uh, describes the believer also. When he was lost, he was non posse non vicari, not able not to sin. He couldn't please God in the flesh. And then he got saved, and he now becomes posse non vicari, able not to sin. That is to say, he's able to live a victorious life through the Spirit of God and love Jesus. He was non posse non vicari, not able not to sin. He now becomes posse non vicari, able not to sin, that is to say, to live a victorious life. But after the rapture, he will then become non posse vicari, not able to sin. I won't be able to sin in heaven, you see. Well, that's apparently the moral classification then of the angels. Some fell and became non posse non vicari, not able not to sin. The ones that remain true are now non posse vicari, not able to sin. And the Bible refers to these, of course, as the elect angels of God. The existence, the origin, the nature, the moral classification, and now Roman numeral 5, the characteristics of the faithful elect angels. What about their rank? Well, we said before that uh, they exist in a sevenfold rank. You have archangels. Uh, there is uh, only one archangel mentioned in the Bible. His name is uh, Michael, but we feel, at least I do, that Gabriel is also in that same category. An archangel, I think, can be described and thought of as a five-star general. Uh, he's uh, reached the top of his class, or maybe he was created that way, I don't know. Uh, but Michael is one, and his name means who is like God. We see Michael involved in the Old Testament, helping the saints of God, especially in Daniel's day. In fact, in Daniel 12, it will be Michael that will stand up for Israel during the tribulation. So Michael has a real job to do here during the tribulation. And then in one of the strangest passages in the Bible, in Jude 1, verse 9, it is Michael who disputes with Satan concerning the dead body of Moses. Um, then you have another, I believe, archangel, his name is Gabriel, and his name means the Mighty One of God. He also, like Michael, ministers to Daniel. Daniel was a man greatly beloved by God. Of all the, well, 6,000 people who walk across the pages of the Bible, Old and New Testament, I know of no other man apart from Daniel that experienced the ministry of both Michael and Gabriel. And uh, you note uh, this particular note here. Some Bible students have, you'll see it in your notes, have identified Gabriel with the various appearances of the angel of the Lord in the remaining pages of the New Testament. Now, the angel of the Lord expression in the Old Testament always refers to Jesus, but Jesus does not appear in the New Testament of the angel of the Lord. He appears as the babe in Bethlehem, and then he ascends after he's crucified and buried and rose again. He ascends, and now he's God's only begotten Son and not the messenger of God as he was in the Old Testament. He now is seated at the right hand of the Father making intercession for us. So the angel of the Lord then in the New Testament is different from the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament. Many believe this to be Gabriel uh, because, among other things, of his uh, work concerning the incarnation of Christ. It was Gabriel that, uh, of course, uh, predicted the birth of John the Baptist to Zacharias. It was Gabriel that predicts the birth of Jesus to Mary. Gabriel that assures Joseph concerning the purity of Mary. It was uh, Gabriel that warns Joseph about the plot of Herod and that later reassures him concerning the death of Herod. So if this is the case, it was uh, Gabriel who announced the birth of Christ to the shepherds and who strengthened Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane and who rolled away the stone at his resurrection and uh, appears to the disciples a number of times in the book of Acts and perhaps the one who will sound the trumpet, the archangel it speaks of in 1 Thessalonians 4.16, 
at the rapture. So that's the first rank of angels, the cherub, the, uh, the archangel, and the second is the cherubims. Now, these are angelic creatures with wings found first in Genesis 3 and then referred to again in Exodus 25, and especially in the book of Ezekiel, particularly chapters 1 and chapters 10. Notice the description of the cherubims. Each has four faces. One looks like a man, the other like a lion, the other like an ox, the other like an eagle. And each has two pair of wings. It's different from another kind of angel that has six pair, uh, but uh, they have two pair. And uh, they have the legs of men, but their feet were cloven like calf's feet, which shone in like burnished brass. And these cherubims have four human hands, with one located under each wing, and they apparently travel in groups of four. In fact, the outstretched wings of each cherubim touches those of the remaining three companions so that they form a square. And when they moved, they moved as a group without turning their bodies. Does that sound familiar? The way they move here and the way they look? Um, well, we'll talk about this a little later when we get into flying saucers. Uh, what are the duties of the cherubims? The first duties assigned them was to keep Adam from the tree of life after the fall, lest he eat of it and live forever in his sin in Genesis 3. And um, then there were two golden cherubims constructed at God's command and placed at either end uh, on top of the covenant ark lid in the tabernacle, Holy of Holies. And then they appeared to Ezekiel in chapter 1 and chapter 10. And we're told that prior to his fall, Satan, who was then known as Lucifer, was the chief cherub angel. So he was from the cherub race or the cherub company of angels before his fall. Lucifer was. So we have archangels and you have cherubims and you have seraphim. Now the word seraphim means burning one. And that probably speaks of the burning devotion to God on the part of these angelic beings. Uh, the cherubims are only mentioned one time, I'm sorry, the seraphims are only mentioned one time in the Bible, and that is in uh, Isaiah chapter 6. And they're somewhat different from the cherubims. They have six wings instead of two. And of course, they cry out, as Isaiah hears them cry out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. I don't remember now, I may be speaking incorrectly, I don't think we have any recorded message of the cherubims in the Old Testament. Uh, we do have uh, some living creatures that may be the cherubims mentioned in the New Testament, and they speak, uh, and I'm sure the Old Testament cherubims could speak, but we do know here that the, the seraphims do speak, and they give awesome praise to God. So, again now, you have the archangels, you have the cherubims, the seraphims, and then the living creatures in Revelation chapter 4. These may be identified with the cherubims or the seraphims, but they are somewhat similar to both, but seem to be in a separate class by themselves. And uh, you can notice the difference here between the cherubims and the living creatures. There does seem to be more differences than there are similarities. And then there are ruling angels among the rank of angels. Uh, we read of principalities and powers and thrones, authorities, dominions, and might. There seems to be a grading of the angels. Of course, it's impossible to distinguish clearly between these six it is nevertheless evident that they describe various levels of ruling positions that are assigned to angels, perhaps ranging, uh, to use an earthy analogy, from, uh, from generals to privates. And then the sixth of the seven full rank of angels are guardian angels. I don't know whether each believer has a guardian angel or not, but we do know that angels, according to Hebrew 1.14, are all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be the heirs of salvation. 
So you do have guardian angels at least associated with children, whether each child has one, we don't know. I suppose they do. Uh, Jesus said, he warned in Matthew 18, take heed that you despise not one of these little ones. He's talking about a child now, children. For I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. That means that these angels have direct access to God uh, concerning the activities of these children. Now, obviously, angels do not pray for the children. Only Jesus prays intercessory prayers for believers on earth. But angels may well be the guardian of these children. Number seven in the rank of angels, you have angels associated with horses and chariots. Angels associated with horses and chariots. Of course, the most familiar passage here is the passage there in 2 Kings 2, the home going of Elijah, the translation of the prophet of God. And as Elisha watches, he sees his master Elijah go up in the sky. And it came to pass, we're told, as they still went on and talked that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and separated them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And then in 2 Kings 6, Elisha sees this same fearful and dazzling sight again. He had a servant who was very worried because they were surrounded by a group of Syrians. And the servant then, his faith was renewed when God showed the frightened man. He didn't have to worry about Elisha because Elisha saw by faith, but his servant was allowed to see by sight. The following here, uh, and Elijah prayed in order to, to uh, take care of the jitters of his young frightened friend upon seeing these Syrian soldiers. Elijah prayed and said, Lord, I pray you, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. Well, now, Wilmington, you've mentioned uh, angels associated with horses and chariots, and we read about these horses and chariots, but how do you know that angels are associated with that? Well, because of the passage here in Psalm 68, verse 17, God says, The chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of angels. So angels now are associated, directly linked to chariots. And so here you have the organization, the rank of these angels. Um, I have a number of pages here, about six or seven pages of typewritten material comparing or maybe contrasting uh, the possibility that, uh, or let me just say this, uh, comparing or contrasting the reports of flying saucers with the account of angels that you read in the Bible, and I intimate that there may be a possibility some of the so-called flying saucer reporting actually is a view of an angel, the sighting, of an angel. Now, we can't prove that, but that may be, that may be the case. And I took this from the Reader's Digest uh, source book. That was very interesting, a summary of flying saucers, and you might like to tie that in with your uh, study of the doctrine of angels. Well, we've looked at the rank of these faithful angels, the sevenfold rank, and their appearance. Now, what about their appearance? Uh, here we'll just read general statements about their appearance in Mark 16, verse 5. And entering into the sepulcher at the resurrection of Christ, we're told these women, they saw a young man sitting on the right side clothed in a long white garment, and they were amazed. So sometimes angels are spoken of as men, but they apparently seem to be angels anyway. Matthew 28, verse 3 Another account of this angel. His countenance was like lightning, and his raiment white as snow. And Luke 24, 
Verse 4, another account. And it came to pass, as they were much perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And then a description of angels mention a particular angel in Revelation 10, verse 1, who will appear during the tribulation. This may be Gabriel, it might be Michael. But uh, John says, I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as though it were the sun, and his feet like pillars of fire. So, in Revelation 18, verse 1, perhaps this is the same angel, after these things, now, now we have the tribulation is ending, and this is right before the battle of Armageddon. After these things, <clears throat> I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was made bright with his glory. So one angel apparently was able to illuminate the entire earth. That's unbelievable as you stop to think about it. Uh, it would uh, take uh, several hundred powerful hydrogen bombs uh, in order to do that. But this one angel has, if we take this literally, and I don't know how else to take it, but literally. Well, what about some of the names and titles for angels? They're called ministers, like human beings are called ministers. In Psalm 103, in Psalm 104, because this signifies their religious duties and their spiritual service. Angels serving as men are to serving. <clears throat> and then it speaks of the host of heaven. And this name, I believe, speaks <clears throat> excuse me, of their military service in fighting the devil and maybe on occasion evil men, the powers that be. So the host of heaven <clears throat> is literally the armies of heaven. Apparently each angel is conscripted into this army. And then they're referred to as chariots, and sometimes they're called chariots, just associated, uh, identified with chariots. The chariots of God are 10,000, speaking of angels. And this may speak of their swiftness uh, to battle. They're called watchers, Daniel 7 or Daniel 4. There was a watcher. This speaks of their duties, perhaps, as supervisors and agents. Billy Graham has a book, Angels, God's secret agents, their watchers. Then they're called the sons of the mighty in Psalm 29 and Psalm 89. This title may refer to their awesome strength and power. And then they're called sons of God. Dr. Schaefer has this written, I think it's very helpful, <clears throat> the founder of Dallas Seminary. He said, in Old Testament, <clears throat> in Old Testament terminology, Sometimes angels are called sons of God, while men are called the servants of God. In the New Testament, this is reversed. Angels are the servants of God, and Christians are the sons of God. This particular order may be due to the fact that in the Old Testament, men are seen as related to this sphere over which the angels are superior, while in the New Testament, saints are seen as related to their final exaltation into the likeness of Christ compared to, with, compared to which the angels are inferior. But they're referred to as sons of God because they're directed creative acts of God. Uh, then they're called the holy ones or saints. That means separation. You usually don't think of a saint as being an angel. Or I mean an angel as being a saint. Uh, but uh, they're referred to saints because this probably refers to their total separation to the will of God. And then stars. Uh, this may re indicate both their number and their brightness. If an angel could il illuminate the entire earth, it had to be pretty bright. And if, again, as we said, their numbers to uh, be compared with the number of stars, uh, there may be trillions and quadrillions of angels. Well, we've looked at uh, some of the names uh, the appearance, uh, the rank. What about the work and ministry of angels? Well, they work in heaven, have a ministry there, and they work on earth. Now, in heaven, they worship the person of God. We read about that in many passages, especially Isaiah 6, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. 
And in Revelation 4, God sees, or uh, John sees the angels worshiping the person of God, the one that sitteth upon the throne. And they observe the people of God. Uh, 1 Corinthians 4, Paul says, I think God has sent, set forth us, the apostles, last, as it were appointed to death, for we are made a spectacle unto the world and to angels and to men. Then Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, one of the reasons a woman ought to have a hat on her head is to show her uh, superior, to show her submission to a man. But another reason why she ought to have something on her head is because of the angels. Maybe angels attend the services of Bible ple- uh, preaching churches because they observe the people of God. Uh, we do know they desire to look into the plan of salvation, according to 1 Peter 1.21. So they worship the person of God, their activities in heaven now. They observe the people of God, and they inquire into the prophetical plan of God. Amazing passage there in Daniel 12. You have to read it carefully to understand what's to catch it. Uh, but one angel is asking another angel about how long the tribulation and how long uh, God's terrible wrath period will exist. So they inquire about the prophetical plan of God. I like to think maybe when I hold a prophecy conference that angels are attending. I'm not sure. Every now and then I feel like a few demons are. Uh, But uh, they inquire into the prophetical plan of God. Then they rejoice in the works of God. His work in creation, the Bible says they shouted for joy, and his work of redemption. Paul says that they're involved in uh, praising God for this. So they rejoice in the works of God, and then they perform the will of God. Uh, The elect angels are always faithful in performing the will of God. They find it, and they perform it, and they fulfill it. They witness the wrath of God. In Revelation 14, verse 10, speaks of the angels uh, actually attending the uh, electrocution, as it were, of all sinners. Now, what are they doing on earth? That's what they're doing in heaven. Concerning the saved, what do angels do? The good angels. They inform, they instruct, they interpret concerning both the will of God and the word of God. Angels in the Old Testament have often interpreted both the will and the word of God to believers. They did this to Daniel. And you can read the list. We have some 11 people mentioned in Old and New Testament that received instruction, information, and interpretation concerning God's will and God's word and God's way, I might say. So they inform, they protect. Psalm 34, 7. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him, and he delivereth them. David says in Psalm 91, For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy way. Another thing they do here on earth, they comfort. It was an angel that comforted Elijah when he was backslidden running for his life from wicked Jezebel. And then they deliver. Simon Peter was set free by an angel of the Lord. And the disciples in Acts 5 were released from prison uh, by an angel. All right, I think we'll close on that note. We'll, the next uh, lecture, discuss their ministry concerning the unsaved and concerning Israel, and then their ministry concerning the Savior. Uh, Angels are very busy, and really, if I were God, I would have used angels instead of men. They're tireless, and they never run out of gas, they're sinless, but for some reason, even though they're swifter and smarter uh, and uh, stronger than men, God has determined to use men to display his glory and not angels.